Got the whole house to myself. It's like I died and went to... Oh, yeah. yeah. Hell. <laughs> Money is love. This is a car. This is a house. And all this is a blonde. <laughs> Hefty paychecks, ridiculous demands, raunchy storylines, and toxic working sets. Al, are you crazy? This is a federal offense. I was just looking. Okay, I'm ready to go. <laughs> this sort of witch's cauldron is a disaster recipe for any promising television show seeking to make its mark. While some shows are built to survive against all odds, some meet their tragic end at the hands of their creators or networks. Hey, babe, how they hanging? <laughs> oh. Hi, Grandma. <laughs> the end result is always the same, loss of a television laurel. Today we are shedding light on six great sitcoms that were canceled for crossing the lines. Number six, Married with Children. By all means, Married with Children was a trailblazer at the time of its release. Peg, kids, time to torture me, I'm home. How's work? Ah, who cares, how's school? Who cares? Good boy. <laughs> so it was almost unimaginable that the show would get canceled without even having a series finale. Yep, that's right. The show ran for 11 seasons on Fox, despite being one of the raunchiest and crudest shows on television. Back then, testing boundaries with dark, offensive comedy was a cardinal sin, but the show creators, Ron Levitt and Michael George Moy, were committed to their comedic flair. It's not golden brown enough. I knew it, I knew it! I'm sorry! The harm's done, bud. Daddy's upset. Don't badger your father, kids. Believe it or not, the show got away with several questionable scenes and instances, including the stark portrayal of erections, strip clubs, and even sex scenes. Oh, hi, son. <laughs> Don't mind me. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Known for being loud and proud of its rude humor, the show stood in contrast with other sitcoms on television in the 1980s. For Fox, the refreshing storyline, which didn't seem to impart any moral lessons, was the perfect show to entrench its new roots in television. Then, of course, all good things must come to an end. Years later, it would be Fox itself that would tank the show before paying any due respects to its cast. In fact, the network didn't even bother to inform its main star, Ed O'Neill, that the show had been canceled for good. Funny stuff, but the reviews for the very first comedy ever to hit the Fox airwaves didn't have executives smiling. One critic said that it was a good idea gone bad. Another said it was disgusting and had absolutely no redeeming value. That came as a surprise to the modern family actor who had given the show his blood, sweat, and tears with the iconic character of Al, the family patriarch. Great, the one thing I would pay for. <laughs> Me too. Good night, Al. In many ways, Al challenged the staunch imagery of a television dad. He was neither an excellent dad nor a bad one. He was just a loser who had weird ways of connecting with his two children, who saw him as an automated teller machine, to say the least. The show revolved around the Bundy family, which was as dysfunctional as it gets. Al was prone to ogle at women, made jokes at the expense of their body weight, was a known misogynist. Excuse me, aren't you Brandy Brandt, Miss October 1987? Why, yes! <laughs> and one time he even took his son to a strip club. Meanwhile, characters like Kelly didn't have any substance to her personality. Her character is reduced to a dumb and sexy blonde who is more of an object to men around her. Despite being a popular television show for its time, its own stars couldn't help but talk about the foulness of the storylines that the creators had entrenched. Can I have the ducky now? There's a little boy out there who really needs it. Tough. <laughs> For instance, Amanda Bears, the iconic neighbor on the show, reminisced about married with children with utmost disappointment and regret. She said, it was a mean-spirited and misogynist show. It was just so completely inappropriate. Today, I don't think the show would be produced because it's so globally offensive. Surprisingly, the crude storylines were hardly a struggle for the show. It's true that the show aimed at breaking the average American stereotype in the most offensive way possible. 
One of the episodes from the third season of the show had to be canceled before it was even on air. The episode involved Al and Peggy discovering sex tapes in the motel they were staying in, which belonged to their infamous neighbors and the motel's owners. Well, my dear, perhaps a change of venue would spice up your sex life. Have you tried doing it in the living room? <laughs> Seeing this as a money-making gimmick, they take the motel owners to court, and in exchange for holding their super-invasive secret, they make $100,000. Yeah, it's a shock that the show survived 11 seasons. What caused its sudden demise then? Well, there was a time when the show lost its hefty viewership. The popular narrative about the cancellation of the show was its loss in positive ratings. However, the show, despite having a large fan base, didn't ever hit the golden spot. Married with Children was popular because at that time, I think a lot of the shows that were on television were very... Um, perfect little families and their perfect little packages. You could either relate to it or you could look at it and go, thank God I'm not like that. The early days of Fox were less than ideal. The channel wasn't accessible in many areas of America, leaving married with children to struggle with a drastically low viewership. While it's true that Fox shows like The Simpsons brought considerable attention to the show, the sitcom still struggled to compete with popular and widely accessible Sunday programs like Murder, She Wrote, and weekly movie nights. During the 11th season of the show, the audience for Married with Children had dropped to a measly 9 million viewers each week. This figure was an insult to the show's popularity, which was racking up 15 million viewers each week just two years prior. Fox had played around with the show's slot, too. The show was shifted to Saturday night, a move that decreased its viewership considerably. Later, to add insult to injury, the sitcom was moved to Monday nights. The network complained that it was next to impossible to cater to the show's hefty production budget, as the audiences weren't tuning in. Not to mention, the show's stars had negotiated extremely high salaries for themselves. But I mean a really, truly heartfelt... House 500 an episode, and I never see your wage slave faces again. <laughs> Done. Thank you, Mr. For a single episode, Ed O'Neill was charging more than $500,000, making him one of the highest paid actors of his time. Other members of the Bundy clan, which included Katie Sagal, Christina Applegate, and David Faustino, were also cashing enormous checks with the show. Fox had outright refused to afford their salaries. What was really disappointing was that when the show's last episode was filmed, the creators had no idea that they wouldn't be coming back for another season. Technically, the show never got to air the very last episode of the sitcom, which would have tied all of the loose ends. The audiences never got any closure, and Married with Children was tanked forever. Number 5. I Dream of Jeannie The 60s and the 70s weren't exactly brimming with a diverse catalog of television shows. Even then, the American viewership was as decisive and choosy about storylines and creative decisions as modern audiences. Without the collectivization powers of the internet, they'd come together to either popularize a show or tank it forever. Fortunately, the fans awarded I Dream of Genie some glory days until a plot line ruined the show forever. Don't get us wrong, though. Before the show was canceled due to its embarrassing ratings on television, it had garnered considerable backlash for its overtly stereotypical portrayals. You see, the genie in the show, who was conveniently named Genie, illuminated all of the harmful Muslim or Arab stereotypes that generated controversy. Genie, I'll never be able to explain you. Well, I... I'm setting you free. Oh, thou hast set me free, master. Now I belong to thee. The show went on to project Muslim Arab men as barbaric and women as submissive. At the same time, the depiction of harems and Genie herself was highly sexualized. Genie didn't seem to have any thought process whatsoever. She was constantly projected to make silly mistakes, and her so-called inferior Arab origins meant that she wasn't fit to survive in modern American civilization. And oh, it gets worse. The show revolves around the American astronaut Major Tony Nelson, 
who rescues the genie after finding her magical abandoned bottle on a deserted island. Being the good Samaritan, Tony sets Genie free. However, she falls in love with the astronaut, feeling bound to him forever. The way the writers of the show captured this dynamic was pretty backward and humiliating for women, even by the standards of the 60s and 70s. Many critics of the show noticed that Nelson was often portrayed as Genie's master, as she relied on him to navigate the curious modern world. Plus, her desperation to stay with her master was compounded by the fact that she fell in love with Tony, who dismissed her feelings multiple times. There's little doubt that the show is popular even today. However, the show's popularity has taken a significant hit due to the narratives surrounding it. In both academia and online spaces, analysts have dragged the show through the mud for profiting off harmful gender and racial stereotypes, but of course, the audiences weren't exactly woke back in the day. Even then, the cancellation of the show was a heartbreaking affair for its fans. You see, the show had many pitfalls, but its popularity, undeniably, came from the charming dynamic between Nelson and Jeannie. The show's main stars have expressed that the evolution of the wannabe romantic relationship with Jeannie was handled poorly. Fans knew what Jeannie had wanted from the very get-go. She was obsessed with a human, and well, any romantic relationship with a man and a spirit was conceptually impossible. Precisely, that ought to be the tension of the show. It was clear that Tony was in love with Jeannie, too. But as all great plot lines go, there was an unresolved tension between the duo that kept the audience hooked. The reason why the fans tuned into Jeannie was to experience the will-they-won't-they they dynamic that was largely missing from other romantic pursuits on television. Now, for any happy-go-lucky show, the most obvious end goal would have been for Tony to acknowledge his feelings and to do the impossible, marry a genie. However, the fans of the show hardly yearned for a resolved storyline. What they actually enjoyed was Jeannie pursuing Tony romantically while being aware of the hefty odds. It's almost confusing how the producers and writers weren't aware of the sentiment of their fan base. In a highly turbulent move, they decided the end goal for Tony and Jeannie was to get married. After that particular plot line was delivered on television, the audience began to flee. There was no reason for them to watch Jeannie anymore. The lovesick puppy had gotten what she wanted and, well, that seemed to be the natural end of the course. Over the years, Barbara Eden and Larry Hangman, who played Jeannie and Tony respectively, have expressed their disappointment over the creative decision. They weren't exactly consulted on their eventual fictional destiny. According to them, the creator of the show had argued against the marriage plotline, but a national broadcasting company executive producer was having none of it. Eden, during her appearance on the Today Show in 2015, remarked, It just ruined the show. Because Jeannie wasn't human, she thought she was, and Tony knew she wasn't. I think it broke credibility. Now, it may sound unbelievable that a single creative decision took down a beloved show. For what it's worth, the show's rating had dramatically gone down after the wedding episode was aired. Eventually, the show's production cost didn't justify the poor audience turnover. In a classic maneuver, the network and producers also failed to notify the stars of the show that they had lost a stable job on television. Imagine Hangman's surprise when he was informed about the show's cancellation by the guy who watched over the studio's gate. Yep, pretty humiliating. Number 4. Buck Rogers in the 25th Century Here's the thing. Second seasons of sci-fi shows are tricky terrain for producers who aren't exactly familiar with the comic strips they are embodying. Somehow, shows like Buck Rogers were able to earn the vote of approval from the comics fans, but then the network tried to make their venture mainstream and eventually failed. Buck Rogers had a promising start, but in the creation of its second season, the main lead, Gil Gerard, was left hurt and disappointed. Gerard was the quintessential example of giving the fans what he wanted. As an astronaut woken up into a new world 500 years later, he rallied hard to give his character substance rather than just superficial fighting scenes. He was able to get control over the attributes of his character, but was hardly involved in the writing process. At one point, the writers of the show would work with 15 subplots that were never tied together. According to Gerard, 
he was forced into several tangents of his story and character, which rarely had any resolve. The audience of the show was left diverted and confused as they saw no trajectory for Buck Rogers. Anyone remotely familiar with the comic strip knew that the story was all about exploring a very foreign and brutal Earth that evolved drastically into the sight of evil. However, the fans were left angered when the newly appointed producer for the show, John Mantley, had whack ideas for the premise of Buck Rogers. For some reason, he was insistent on sending Gerard to space rather than letting him explore the unfamiliar terrain of Earth. By the end of the second season, the show had turned into a cheap, tacky ripoff of icons like Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica. When Gerard tried to rally against the producer at Universal, he was deemed difficult and hard to work with. Eventually, after the second season, the show was canceled, leaving Gerard and the fans of Buck Rogers angry and disappointed. Number 3. Bewitched Mixing pleasure with business is often a bad idea, and the tragic demise of a show as promising as Bewitched will tell you exactly why. The show, which aired on American Broadcasting Company from 1964 to 1972, was a breath of fresh air in many ways. While the show had all of the typical remnants of an American couple living a typical life, the dynamics of the Stevens household were hardly ordinary. You see, the matrimonial alliance of Darren and Samantha was often interrupted by the wife's magical status, for a witch to marry an ordinary mortal guy was akin to self-destruction. However, Samantha is so enchanted by Darren that she agrees to anger her coven to live the life of an ordinary suburban wife. That sort of arrangement had its fair share of challenges, including Darren's oddly hilarious entanglement with Samantha's magical spells. It wasn't surprising that the show was loved by many, so it was utterly shocking and baffling when the show was canceled abruptly, despite being renewed for two seasons. Unlike many sitcoms that are taken off the shelf, Bewitched never had any problems with ratings or an unfaithful fan base. In fact, the show, even with highly inaccessible network television, reached many audiences. All sources would describe Bewitched as nothing but popular. In its debut season, it was the second-rated show in America. For the first three seasons, the show was in the top ten most-watched shows on television. Seasons four and five saw a slight dip in its viewership. Even then, Bewitched was able to secure the eleventh spot in the most viewed rating list. Now, the most important question to ask is, who was in charge of its fate? Well, everything boiled down to Elizabeth Mognomentary, who played the iconic role of Samantha on the show. Being the friendly, attractive witch on television had given her a considerable career boost. Everywhere she went, she was met with love and appreciation. Playing Samantha became the apex of her career, as she was nominated for five Primetime Emmy Awards and four Golden Globes. Known as one of the classiest and most sought-after actresses of her time, she was every director's dream, but to everyone's surprise, that precisely became the show's Achilles' heel. For Elizabeth, the set of Bewitched wasn't just her workplace, it was the site of a romantic affair, too. You see, Mognamentary fell in love and decided to tie the knot with William Asher in 1963, a year before Bewitched went on air. That doesn't seem like a problem until you realize that the majority of the episodes of the show were directed by Asher, Elizabeth's husband. Being the wife of the top dog didn't impact her craft, but her turbulent married life became an issue on set. Throughout the couple's marriage, it was known that Asher was prone to flirt with women who weren't his wife. While the couple tried to keep their matrimonial issues hush-hush, the truth eventually found its way out. It turns out Elizabeth was devastated when she found out that her husband had cheated on her. Her troubled life led her to begin a love affair with Richard Michaels, an American director. Michaels and Mognomentary were friends and had worked together on projects. Feeling rejected by her husband, Elizabeth began to confide in Richard, who was married at the time. Their exposed love affair made explosive headlines. The media hardly focused on how Asher had ruined their marriage. The spicy narrative was that the actress had turned on the very husband who had made her into a star with Bewitched. That sort of media scrutiny broke Elizabeth, who refused to rejoin the show for its ninth and tenth seasons. Since Asher's company was also producing the show, he was also in favor of canceling it for good. 
Eventually, the so-called power couple of Hollywood decided to call it quits, too. After Michael divorced his wife, he married Elizabeth only for them to break up within two and a half years. Over the years, William Asher decided to become very vocal about his pitfalls and mistakes that took Elizabeth away from him and the beloved show from its loyal fan base. As the decision to cancel the show was pretty abrupt, the audiences never got to see the end of Darren and Samantha. Later, it was also revealed that Elizabeth was more and less forced into the world of Bewitched. Sources close to the couple revealed that William had changed his wife's mind to star in his company's brainchild. She had to be at the center of the spotlight, which she very openly despised, but her husband compelled her to attend a meeting with American Broadcasting Company, and, well, the network made an offer that she couldn't refuse. Other than being the main lead, Mognomentary owned 20% of Bewitched, ultimately making millions of dollars off the show. Even then, the toxic environment on the set took the best of her. Number 2. The Rockford Files There are very few shows in the history of television that effortlessly and almost naturally transitioned their way to the top. And the fan favorite The Rockford Files knew how to reign over television. In many ways, the iconic show was a regular at acquiring the top spots. It spent considerable time on the top 100, top 50, and even the top 10 best shows of all time. There's no doubt that the show was a quintessential crime show with a charismatic main lead embodied by the very sensational Maverick star, James Garner. However, even the worst critics of the show had to agree that Jim Rockford was anything but familiar to the audiences with zero direct comparison with iconic characters like James Bond. The show's character crafting was so outstanding that even the good guy was human enough to fail or get beaten up by the bad guys. Unlike James Bond, Rockford isn't a suave ladies' man. If anything, he is a broke, hapless man who can't bring himself to own the villain. In many ways, the Rockford Files redefined what it means to be a hero on television, and the fans welcomed it with an open heart. Then one day, the show suddenly went off air, leaving hardcore fans hurt and disappointed. Nope, the Red Rock Files wasn't canceled. There was no reason for the network to take such a decision. However, ultimately, it was the craft of the show that had taken the best of James Garner. The actor was warned to take the character easy. After all, Garner insisted that no matter how hard or challenging a stunt was, he would do it himself. The show's creators were worried that their lead would get lethargic as the show went on, or worse, he would get injured. Well, let's say that they weren't exactly wrong. In particular, Garner insisted that he would do fist fights and car chases himself, an array of scenes that require multiple cuts and do-overs. Since his character didn't carry a gun and was more into the physical act of steering away the bad guys, the show was filled with multiple sequences where Garner had to get every move right, at times, they would spend hours on such action scenes, and as expected, the actor was left physically exhausted. Not to mention, his knees were pummeled over and over again. Coupled with other problems like ulcers, James Garner was left with little to no physical strength after filming a scene or two. During this time, he had already played the challenging role in Maverick, and due to his dislike for action men and stunt doubles, he was paying double the price in the Rockford Files, too. The fact that Garner did his own scenes didn't change the series at all. As the show went on, he took beatings upon beatings. And yep, most of these scenes were more than real. It wasn't shocking that the actor had developed chronic back pain that never went away. He would be in agony, but would still insist on doing his scenes. However, a detailed consultation with his medical team thankfully changed his mind. James Garner was utterly disappointed, but he knew that he had to stop doing his stunts. By the sixth season of the show, he had to bow out and call in the stunt double. Yet, it was too late. Even with a team of highly trained and expensive stuntmen, playing Rockford had taken the best of James Garner. By mid-1979, he was suffering from knee injuries and back pain. At a certain point, the actor was also unable to do a simple running scene. As a result, he had decided to take time off filming the show, sending the Red Rock files into an abrupt hiatus in late 1979. It is true that the actor was hoping to recover, but the severity of his physical injuries rendered it impossible.
Very quickly, the short hiatus was turned into a final retirement, causing the National Broadcasting Company to cancel the show mid-season in January 1980. Now, the decision was extremely unpopular among the fans of the show as well as the creators. However, there's a huge chance that the financiers and the network perhaps viewed Garner's retirement as a blessing in disguise. The rumor on the block was that the show was getting extremely expensive to produce because the creators kept bargaining for expensive guest appearances and recruitments. The show hosted many big and famous names in the industry, such as Bill Mumy of Lost in Space fame, Abe Vigoda from Barney Miller, the bionic woman herself, Lindsay Wagner, and even Tom Selleck. Not to mention, Garner's contract with Universal had started with $25,000 for an episode as part of his royalties. It was reported that the actor made $100,000 per episode. On top of that, the actor demanded stellar authenticity for the location of the scenes, too. If the script said that the scene was set in Malibu, Garner took the crew to Malibu. In fact, Jim's trailer was filmed right along the Pacific Coast Highway. Pretty sure securing a filming license was costly for the network. Then, there was the persistent issue of practical stunts. Every time Jim damaged his car, which was a lot of times, it needed very real repairs. The charm of the character came with authenticity in every scene. So, of course, the show had to bash the car in real time for Garner to thrive. There was an instance when Garner was supposed to break wooden crates, so he did his damage to a $700 crate that was destroyed in mere seconds. An insider source revealed that the show's production team was procuring like crazy. And when Garner stepped away from the show, they had already acquired materials for the set that had little to no use for them. As expected, the show had created a damage of millions. They knew that if Garner didn't return to the screen or was replaced by someone else, fans wouldn't be tuning in and would likely leave the show in major debt. In that case, the best idea was to pull the plug on the show altogether, even if it meant leaving Rockford deserted and abandoned. Number 1. Gilligan's Island The tragic ending of Gilligan Island was perhaps the most controversial television decision of its time. Let's be honest. There was no reason not to love the show. When seven castaway people from diverse walks of life are forced to survive on a lonely island after a violent storm, chaos is bound to ensue, and well, what's not to like? The show had a very refreshing premise, with profoundly interesting storylines. Gilligan Island had made its mark when American audiences were obsessed with westerns, and the Sherwood Schwartz were able to break that spell. From 1964 to 1967, the show entertained its audiences thoroughly. However, Columbia Broadcasting System got extremely dubious about the show's future during the third season when its audiences dipped slightly. It wasn't a major issue, though. Gilligan Island was doing considerably better than its main national broadcasting company competitor for the same Monday slot, The Monkees. This is why Columbia Broadcasting System had told Sherwood that the show would make a comeback for its fourth season. The cast and crew were excited. Some of the actors even bought a new house near the set to bring their families closer to their work life. At the same time, Columbia Broadcasting System was planning to cancel Gunsmoke, a multi-decade spanning Western show. While the drama had its loyal and very vocal fan base, the network still wanted to cut Gunsmoke loose. That didn't happen, though. When word of the show's cancellation got out, Columbia Broadcasting System's network president, William Samuel Paley and his wife Babe began to intervene. It didn't help that the fan base of Gunsmoke had started a hate chain against the network for canceling their weekly entertainment staple. Columbia Broadcasting System was forced to act. They knew that it was time to change the occupier of their prime slot. So they decided to put Gunsmoke on a less lucrative Monday, 7030 program. The very same slot that Gilligan Island had occupied for three years. Columbia Broadcasting System decided to bring back the Western drama at the expense of another fan favorite. And let's say that the constant reboot and popular syndication of Gilligan Island is enough proof of the network's bad decision making. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.